Hitler is a name that is always going to be associated with political unrest, the Aryan supremacy, and the murder of over 6 million Jews and 5 million other people. Over a period of 12 years, Hitler and the Nazi party took a hold of Germany and inflicted terror on all of Europe. But let's take a quick step back. How did one person actually become a mass murderer of over 11 million people? Born in Austria in 1889, Hitler grew up wanting to be an artist, but that dream proved unsuccessful. His interest turned towards politics and the military when he volunteered to fight in World War I. Germany's defeat in the war set the foundation for Hitler's future rise. Germany fought alongside Austria-Hungary, as well as the Ottoman Empire. The loss to the Allied forces of the United States, Italy, Japan, France, Russia, and Great Britain ended with devastating losses on both sides. He believed that the loss of the war was not due to the Allies, but instead to those back at home that he considered insufficiently patriotic. He viewed them as traitors due to their lack of support in the war. After the war, Hitler joined the German Workers' Party. They primarily focused on connecting the working class with German nationalism. Hitler's charm and his power with words made him the perfect candidate to head their propaganda campaign. That campaign would transform the group into the Nazi party, who would later adopt the Hackenkreuz, an ancient hooked cross as its symbol, better known today as a swastika. The symbol originally meant different things in different cultures across the world, including divinity, prosperity, and good luck. However, the Nazi party would change the meaning of the symbol forever. It would later represent terror and death. In less than a year, Hitler became the leader of the Nazi party, and along with his strong arm squads, or SA, he became the hero in the eyes of many. Hitler sought power, and his anti-Semitic beliefs and obsession with race and ethnic purity became his primary focus. He wanted to create a world where the Aryan race was supreme. The SA later became the SS, or Schutzstaffel, and youngsters were organized into Hitler Youth. These followers swore an oath to be loyal only to him. Hitler failed at his first attempt at becoming Germany's chancellor, but ultimately was given the title by the president after those before him were unable to maintain control of Germany. He finally achieved the level of power he desired, and then the Third Reich was born. In just over six months, a law passed that made the Nazi party the only political party of all of Germany. His thirst for power and conquest led him to weed out and murder any followers that were considered problematic. When the president died, the offices of the chancellor and president were combined, making Hitler the only leader and giving him command over Germany's entire armed forces. Hitler was finally right where he wanted to be. With nothing in his way, he went about expanding his power and cementing himself as a Führer, also known as a supreme leader. He set his sights on lands to the east and the lands of what he considered inferior people. Less than a year later, Hitler passed the Nuremberg Laws, depriving Jews of German citizenship and legalizing their persecution. In the eyes of the Nazis, Jews were considered rats. They were subhuman, a parasitic threat to all that was noble in humanity. But even before Hitler took full control of Germany, him and the SS had already begun running these operations, basically a network of concentration camps with the sole purpose of holding and separating Jews and other targets of the regime. Now, after World War II, the purpose of the camps changed. They no longer were meant to hold and separate Jews. They were meant to exterminate them. Mobile death squads began to wipe out entire Jewish communities, while their death camps expanded to countries outside of Germany. The most infamous of these camps was the Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland. Those taken to the camps were never to know their fate. The Nazis made all possible preparations to ensure that those who were going to die did not know what was about to happen. They essentially put on a show, using elaborate props and deception in order to mislead them. Victims were promised both food and water. They were told also they would receive a shower and they would be set up for work. Staged railway stations were built to transport Jews to the camps. The SS men even went as far as to wear railmen uniforms to convince the Jews that they were there for work. Another staged railway station awaited them at the camps. They were told this station was just a stop on the way to their final destination. After the passengers shuttled from the train cars to what appeared to be your average building, they encountered the most twisted part of the Nazis' show of good faith. As they entered the gas chambers, they would see painted flowers and even a Star of David. These beautiful paintings were intended to keep the victims calm and trick them into believing that they were safe. Others were brought to rooms made to look like showers. 
complete with tile walls and nozzles. Victims were told to undress so they can shower and clean up before getting settled. The nozzles were, of course, only for show. The reason being is that the Nazis, funny enough, believed that human beings should be killed humanely. This could only be achieved meeting four conditions. The first one being that the victims should never be aware that they were about to die. Second, those who were doing the killing should never have to see, touch, or God forbid, hear them while they died. Third, there should be no visible evidence of harm on the bodies. And lastly, the moment of death should be instantaneous. In the beginning, this was not easily achieved, but they finally met their goal through much trial, error, and experimentation. In the gas chambers, carbon monoxide from a truck engine was pumped into the chamber. At Auschwitz, a pest control chemical called Zyklon B was used as it was deemed faster and more reliable than a possibly faulty motor engine. Those who weren't chosen to die in the chambers were brought to labor camps. They built tunnels that would be used to store military weapons. Some were given the job of removing the dead from the gas chamber and bringing them to the crematoriums. Most in the labor camps died from brutal conditions, starvation, and disease. Some Jews were never brought to the camps at all. Extermination took place in cities, towns, and across Europe using gas vans. Dozens were shoved into zinc-lined trucks where carbon monoxide was pumped from the engine. Victims were usually dead upon arrival at their destination. They were burned or buried in pre-dug mass graves. What is truly disturbing is that these trucks were painted on the outside with the trusted symbol of the Red Cross. Large groups were gathered and piled into overcrowded freight and passenger cars. No space was wasted and many perished before they even got to the camps. Once they disembarked, they were quickly sorted. Their luggage and any personal belongings were taken away from them to see if the Nazis could use them later on. Those who weren't chosen for slave labor would continue. Clear paths were laid out from the train platform to the gas chambers. Once there, they were shuttled from the undressing rooms to meet their fate. The journey from the train cars to the gas chambers was smooth and efficient, a conveyor belt of death. Gassing was practical, allowing large numbers of people to be brought in and then quickly disposed of. Bodies were removed immediately from the chambers and stacked in crematoriums, officially eliminating the problem of piles of dead bodies to bury. This whole process and environment was built for the Nazis. As we mentioned before, one of the goals of this process was for the people who were actually killing the Jews not to hear or see them going through that process. Hitler succeeded in creating this massive murder machine that was capable of killing thousands of people every single day. After the Nazis succeeded in industrializing mass murder, the cycle continued unbroken from 1933 to 1945. Now backtrack to 1942, at the height of the concentration camps, 2.7 million Jews were killed in that year. While most camps were primarily composed of gas chambers and labor camps, Auschwitz offered an entirely different fate for a selected few. While still on the train platforms of Auschwitz, twins were plucked from the crowds and brought to labs to be examined. Now you might be asking yourself, why twins? Well, the Germans knew that twins share a genome. And the Nazis believe criminal behavior and even poverty stem from genetics and could therefore be eliminated through selective breeding. Under the guise of medical research, these victims were subject to disease, disfigurement, and even torture. For the Nazis, it was an experiment of nature versus nurture. Inhumane medical experiments were performed on thousands of twins, most of them being children. One twin acted as control, while the other was subjected to experimentation that included everything from being injected with diseases, to being forcibly inseminated, to amputations, and even murder. After death, they were dissected and studied. The remaining twin was then killed and then subjected to the same fate. Genetic information was gathered from the twins to find out if traits of the disease were inherited. Although the twin subjects were given medical care and extra food and lived separate from the labor camps, they suffered unfathomable treatment that could last for days, weeks, or even months. Ironically, these twisted experimentations were a far cry from the Nazis' ideal humane treatment, which we spoke of before. As I was doing research for this video, one question always kind of lingered over my head, which is why? Like, what led him to become the person that he became? Essentially, the embodiment of pure evil. What was the reason behind Hitler's horrific acts? Was it childhood trauma? Was it the effects of war? Or maybe was it the fact that he was five foot nine and he was mad about being short? 
While not much is known about his childhood, it is said that Hitler was frail and often sick. His father was abusive to the extreme. Hitler's dad, being a tyrant, whipped him and his brother almost daily. Receiving the brunt of his father's abuse, it is said that he wouldn't cry. He refused to give his dad the satisfaction from his cruel act. He developed what was called syphilophobia as a child, which caused him to be afraid of sexual contact with women, as it may contaminate him. Acquaintances say that this caused him to be impotent later in life. Since he was an only child, Hitler had no control, and the lack of control would likely create feelings of resentment, powerlessness, and even revenge. Whether consciously or unconsciously, his childhood experiences could easily have caused him to seek out power and control later in life. At 14 years old, Hitler's dad died, and it's believed that all his anger and resentment against his father was transferred over to Jews, using them as a scapegoat. In psychology, this is called a counteractive type, a psychological profile who is completely motivated by both resentment and revenge due to wounded ego and feelings of inferiority. Today, he would be diagnosed as having a narcissistic personality disorder. His intense feelings of inferiority caused him to strive for superiority. Referred to as masculine protest, he harbored aggression and an insatiable desire to gain, as well as feelings of defiance and resentment. Hiller also had a documented series of manic episodes, oftentimes leading to emotional outbursts of crying or rage. This suggests some sort of bipolar disorder. Although he was very close to her, Hitler harbored negative feelings against his mother, blaming her for not protecting him from his father's abuse. It's said that Hitler also struggled with severe anxiety, which led oftentimes to destructive behavior. His personal physician prescribed him both barbiturates and amphetamines, causing extreme highs and lows. Referred to as a dysdaemonic genius, Hitler possessed both exceptional creativity as well as strong tendencies towards the dark side meaning destruction, evil, and perversion. This startling combination brings images to mind of twisted monsters such as Osama bin Laden, David Koresh, and even the fictional Darth Vader. Now, there's no doubt that Hitler was gifted with the ability to influence and motivate the masses by becoming the incarnation of the crowd's unspoken needs and cravings, as written by Harvard psychologist Henry Murray in his analysis. He also points out that leaders such as Hitler become inflated by a grandiose identification with the messiah archetype present within each of us. Now, does this statement suggest that we all have a savior complex to an extent? Or to take it even further, does that mean given the right circumstances, are all of us capable of embodying such evil as Hitler did? And it's also difficult to really know how cruel Hitler was just because the Nazis were actually really good at covering their tracks and also eliminating any sort of evidence towards the end of their regime. The truth is, we're never really going to know how cruel he was, but it's safe to say that he was not a nice person.